Hello everyone, welcome back to the 1000 MCQ series of Analyst Grade 3 exam and Pharmacist exam. So in today's uh, discussion, we will discuss 10 questions taken from the different subjects given in the Analyst Grade 3 exam and we will discuss question number 521 to 530. So without any further delay, let's move on to the first question of the day. So this question is taken from the pharmaceutics. Okay, so a 25 year old pregnant lady was prescribed with a folic acid by a gynecologist. Which among the following is the correct format of prescription? Okay, so you know that uh, in the initial trimester, uh, trimester of pregnancy, the pregnant ladies will be given with folic acid. Now here the question is that in the prescription, which is the correct format? Okay, so couple of things you need to remember with respect to the prescription. So in a correct prescription writing, there should be the doctor's details, the name, the address, the signature should be there, the date should be there, the patient details should be there, the um, address and all those things. Now, you need to remember a couple of things. There will be uh, a part called superscription, okay, which is denoted by the symbol Rx, represented by the symbol Rx, which stands for recipe, the word recipe, it's a Latin word, recipe, okay, which means to take. Okay. So basically this uh, superscription is represented by this Rx, which is nothing but an in instru instruction given from doctor to the pharmacist to take it, okay. Now, there is another term called as inscription, which is, uh, which is called as the body of the prescription. So the main body of the prescription is called as inscription. So here the details of the medication prescribed, the de details of the medication prescribed would be there. For example, the name of the uh, drug, the amount or the strength of the drug. So all those things comes in the inscription, which is called as the body of the prescription. Okay. Now the, the another term you need to remember is called a subscription, which is again an instruction from the doctor to the pharmacist. Okay. Uh, which tells that how many uh, how many number of tablets should be dispensed. So such details comes in the subscription, which is an instruction from the doctor to the pharmacist. Okay. Now there is another term called a signature, which is an instruction from the pharmacist to the patient. So that what, what, how to take the medication, what is the storage condition. So it's a direction uh, given to the patient by the pharmacist is called a signature. So these are the things which has to come in a prescription. Okay, superscription, inscription, subscription, signature, these terms you need to remember. Now here the question is something different. Uh, the question is that which is the correct format of prescription. Let's look into the option. So you know that in a prescription or the inscription there, which is the body of the prescription, the formulation name should be there. Okay, whether it's a tablet or a capsule that detail should be there so formulation should the formulation should be there now the actual name of the drug should be there so here you can see the uh, the, the name of the drug is given folic acid now remember the name of the drug should be should be given in detail not in an abbreviated form so you can see that for here in the choice a and choice b the folic acid the name has been given in detail not the abbreviation but if you look at this choice c it is given fa the abbreviated form of folic acid that is not the ideal way of or the correct format of prescription so this uh, c choice you can directly tell that it is not correct okay because the folic acid they have given as an abbreviation so that is not a correct format of prescription now you are left with the choice a and choice b okay now let's proceed so formulation is given name of the drug is given now the dose is given the dose has to be given what quantity of the drug has to be given so here it is given the dose has been given now the frequency of the dose Okay, whether it has to be taken once a day by the uh, BD or a thrice a day like that, the frequency should be there. Now, whether which route should be administered, whether it's oral, parenteral or sublingual, what route you should take the drug, that should be there. Now, what duration you need to take, for what duration you need to take, so these details should come. So, formulation, name of the drug in full, uh, with full name, dose of the drug, frequency, route, duration, all these things should come in a prescription. Now, you can see that. In the choice B also tablet, the formulation is given, folic acid is given, the frequencies uh, are same, the oral, the root is given 60 days. Now, what is the difference here? The difference is in the dose. So, one is given in 400 mu g, the other one is given in 400 mcg. So, what is the difference here? So, remember, microgram, whenever a drug is prescribed in microgram, the correct way to represent is mcg. Okay. Normally, we use the symbol mu to represent microgram, correct? But in prescription, this is a wrong. In prescription, whenever you wanted to write microgram, always put MCG. The reason is that when you put the symbol, sometimes the symbol can be read as M. Okay, so that may end up in a wrong wrong uh, dose. Okay, so always remember, whenever you wanted to prescribe, give a drug or take a drug in microgram quantity, the right way to represent is MCG. Okay, you should not never represent by UG. Also, you need to uh, remember a couple of things. Like, uh, for example, one let, let us uh, take uh, one drug 0.4 MG. 
exactly 0.4 mg you need to take okay remember 0.4 mg you need to write 0.4 mg rather so this is the correct way but if you write just 0.4 mg this is a wrong way because sometimes the the pharmacist or this they may not see this dot so they may end up in giving 4 mg which is a higher dose okay so whenever you wanted to write 0.4 mg always write 0.4 mg also remember suppose we want to give 4 mg you just write 4 mg rather than that don't write 4.0 mg that is a wrong way although both are same that is a wrong way because sometimes if the pharmacist don't see this uh, dot he may read it as 40 mg okay so always write like 4 mg 0.4 mg like that okay and always remember when it comes to microgram the correct way is mcg okay so these are the couple of important points you need to remember with the, the correct format of prescription now let's come back to the choice so what was the wrong thing here so a choice they have written mu g which is not a correct way okay so obviously it mu g has to be written as mcg so the correct answer or the correct format of prescription is b choice where they have written the formulation name of the drug dose frequency route of administration and duration so b is the correct format of prescription okay. okay so let's move on to the second question of the day so this question is taken from the pharmacology which are the following anti-diabetic drug causes glycosuria so it's a kind of a side effect actually so all these drugs are anti-diabetic drugs so you know that uh, glipicide they are basically sulfonylurea drugs right sulfon second generation sulfonylurea glipicide glyclacide glybenglamate so you know that in the the adr of sulfonylurea the main adr of sulfonylurea is hypoglycemia hypoglycemia and weight gain these are the two side effects or adverse effects of uh, uh, the sulfonylurea drugs now you can see uh, the second choice gliptin drugs wilda gliptin so basically gliptin drugs you know what is the mechanism of gliptin drugs which they belong to dpp4 inhibitor dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor the mechanism of action is dpp4 inhibitors okay so the name end with the gliptin okay wilda gliptin saxagliptin cetagliptin alogliptin all those gliptin drugs belong to dpp4 inhibitor and what is the main adr of uh, uh, gliptin drugs the answer is nasopharyngitis nasopharyngitis is the main adr of gliptin drugs now let's move on to the c choice acarbos acarbos comes under alpha glucosidase inhibitor so acarbos comes the mechanism of action of acarbos they are also you know anti-diabetic drug which is mechanism is alpha glucosidase inhibitor and the main side effect of this drug is flatulence flatulence is the main adverse effect of acarbos now the coming to the fourth uh, choice glyphosin canagliflozin there are a lot of glyphosin drugs what is the mechanism of glyphosin drug canagliflozin is there dapagliflozin is there empagliflozin is there so the name ends with the glyphosin so what is the mechanism of action of glyphosin drug yes it is a sodium glucose transport 2 inhibitor okay sgl2 inhibitor the expanded form is sodium glucose transport 2 inhibitor so glyphosin drug belong to sgl2 inhibitor now let us take what is this sgl so, so, so you know that this is a neuron okay this is the proximal convoluted tubule this is the loop of henley distal convoluted tubule and this collecting duct right now in this pct proximal convoluted tubule there is this um, sodium glucose transport 2 what does it do it helps to reabsorb the glucose it helps to reabsorb the glucose to the blood so that is what the function of this sgl2 they reabsorb uh, glucose through this sgl2 pump to the blood that is the normal function now if you inhibit this pump sgl2 if you inhibit this thing the reabsorption of glucose won't be there so you can decrease the glucose level in the uh, sir, blood. So that is how it acts. The mechanism of glyphosin uh, drug is SGL2 inhibitor. Now the problem is that when you inhibit this pump, the glucose will travel through this tube, okay, through this urine. Okay, so glucose will come through the urine. So that is called as glycosuria. So glyphosin drug, since it is a SGL2 inhibitor, the glucose will come in the urine. Now is there any problem? Yes. If glucose comes more, passes more through the urine, there is a chance for urinary tract infection. So remember these two points: glycosuria is one of the problem with the SGL2 inhibitor that in fact can result in urinary tract infection. So remember all glyphosin drugs has a, has a chance to cause urinary tract infection because it causes the flow of glucose in urine, glycosuria. Okay, So it causes the glucose to pass through the urine. Okay, So coming back to your question, which of the following anti-diabetic drug causes glycosuria? Yes, answer is glyphosin drug. So it will result in urinary tract infection so the correct answer for this question is d choice canna glyphosin okay let's move on to the next question so basically this question is taken from the medicinal chemistry so tetracyclines are derivative of dihydronaphthacin tetrahydronaphthacin 
hexahydronaphtacin or octahydronaphtacin. Okay, so you know that tetracycline is a broad spectrum antibiotic. The main drug is doxycycline. You know that. It's still, it is prescribed nowadays. Now, you in the first picture, okay, in the first structure, you can see that four benzene. This is the first benzene ring, second, third, and fourth. Okay, you can see four benzene rings fused together. So, this structure is called as naphthacin. So, when four benzene structures are fused together, the, that structure is called as naphthacene. Okay, or you can call it as tetracene. Tetracene. Okay, now, how many double bonds are there in naphthacene? You can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That means 9 double bones are there. 9 double bones are there. Okay. So, this structure is called as naphthacin. Now, when you take tetracycline, the structure of tetracycline, the basic structure of tetracycline looks like this. Now, what is the difference here? Now, here you can see that some double bones are missing. How many double bones are there now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 double bones are there. 5 double bones are there in the second structure, below structure. That means, compared to naphthacin, how many double bones are missing? 4 double bones are missing. Okay, or 4 double bones are removed in the structure given below. Now, if you wanted to remove one double bone, to remove one double bone, to remove one double bone, how many hydrogens you need to add? For removing one double bone, you need to add two hydrogens. To remove two double bones, how many hydrogens you need to add? Four hydrogens you need to add. Three, to remove three double bones, how many hydrogens you need to add? You need to add six hydrogens, right? So, here you can see that four double bones are removed. So, to remove four double bones, you need to add eight hydrogens. So, the bottom structure is called as octahydronaphthacin. Okay, because four double bones are missing. So, octahydronaphthacin. So, in tetracycline, four double bones are missing from the naphthacin structure. Therefore, they are called as octahydronaphthacin or they are derivatives of tetracyclines are derivatives of octahydronaphthacin. I hope you understood why it is called as octahydronaphthacin. So, coming back to your question, tetracyclines are derivatives of B choice octahydronaphthacin. Okay, let's move on to the next question of the day. So, this question is taken from the biochemistry. So, which one of the following is not a true ketone body? Okay, so you know that the ketone bodies are energy releasing uh, molecules. So, there are mainly three ketone bodies. Okay, so when it comes to ketone bodies, there are mainly three. The number one, acetoacetate, acetoacetate. So, acetoacetate is considered to be the primary ketone body. Okay, the primary ketone body. From acetoacetate, you will get acetone. That is also a ketone body. However, acetone is, uh, uh, you are getting acetone from acetoacetate. So, acetone, also the, the third um, um, ketone body, you need to remember beta hydroxybutyrate. So, these are the three ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate. So, acetoacetate, acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Remember, acetone you will get from acetoacetate. So, acetone is considered to be a secondary ketone body. Beta-hydroxybutyrate also you will get from acetoacetate. So, this is also secondary ketone body. So, actually the primary ketone body is acetoacetate, whereas acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate are secondary ketone body. Now, the question here was not a true ketone body. Okay, not a true ketone body. Now, when you look at the structure of acetoacetate, the structure will be like this. CH3, C double bond O, CH2, COO minus. That means acetoacetate. Okay. Now, when you look at, the, you know the structure of acetone. Acetone means CH3, C double bond O, CH3. Correct? Now, whereas butahydroxybutyrate, the structure would look like this. You write butyrate. So, this is butyrate. This is the alpha carbon, this is the beta carbon. The beta carbon you attach a hydroxy group. This is called as beta hydroxybutyrate. Now, here you look at the first structure. You can see that there is a keto group in acetoacetate. There is a ketone group. You look at acetone, there is also a ketone group is there. But you look at beta hydroxybutyrate, there is no ketone. It is hydroxyl group. So, beta hydroxy, uh, so you can tell that acetoacetate and acetone, they are true ketone bodies. They are true ketone bodies. Where beta hydroxybutyrate, they are not true ketone bodies because it does not contain a carbonyl carbon okay true ketone body okay so the answer for this question which am not a true ketone body of course the answer would be the answer would be beta hydroxy butyrate okay whereas acetone acetate acetone as well as acetoacetate they are true ketone bodies true ketone bodies okay sure next question so, this question is again taken from biochemistry. Which of the following metabolic disorder occurs due to the deficiency of homogentesic acid oxidase? A choice, PKU. B choice, AKU. C choice, albinism. D choice, tyrosinemia. Okay. So, basically, these are all 
amino acid metabolic disorders okay met uh, disorders of amino acid metabolism so pku is nothing but phenyl ketonuria aku is nothing but alkaptonuria aku is called as alkaptonuria tyrosinemia albinism these are all the disorders of amino acid metabolism so these are the main disorders of amino acid metabolism phenyl ketonuria alkaptonuria then um, tyrosinemia and albinism now you need to remember for which enzyme is defective or which enzyme is deficient in each of this metabolic disorder. For example, in phenyl ketonuria, the enzyme which is deficient is called as PAH enzyme. What is PAH? Phenyl alanin hydroxylase. So this is the enzyme which is deficient in the phenyl ketonuria patient or the deficiency of this enzyme will result in phenyl ketonuria. Now, alkaptonuria is also called as black urine disease. Black urine disease. It is due to the deficiency of an enzyme called as homogentisate oxidase. Homogentisate oxidase. So, homogentisate oxidase deficiency can cause alkaptonuria or black urine disease. Homogentisate oxidase is also called as homogentisic acid. 1,2 dioxygenase. So, both name you remember homogentisate oxidase or homogentisic acid 1,2 dioxygenase. Now, tyrosinemia is due to the deficiency of tyrosine transaminase, abbreviated as TT. Tyrosine transaminase deficiency can result in tyrosinemia. Now, albinism is due to the deficiency of tyrosinase enzyme tyrosinase enzyme okay so you need to remember the four metabolic disorders of amino acid and the corresponding enzyme which is deficient you need to so, so please study this table to, to answer that question okay so here the question is uh, very simple homogenesis acid oxidase deficiency will result in alkaptonuria abbreviated as aku okay so hope you understood this question now let's move on to the next question so this question is taken from the biotechnology syllabus given uh, biotechnology subject given in the syllabus which among the following immunobloating uh, technique is used to, to detect rna now remember this immunobloating technique can be divided into can be divided into three southern bloat northern bloat and western bloat okay now southern bloat is used to detect dna northern bloat is used to detect rna and western bloat is used to detect protein so you can remember this mnemonic snowdrop snowdrop okay so s stands for southern bloat it is used to detect dna Northern blot N stands for northern blot. It is used to detect RNA. Western blot W Western blot is used to detect protein. So you can remember this mnemonic snowdrop. Okay, let's come to the question. Which technique is used to uh, detect RNA? So the answer is northern blot. Okay, snowdrop you can remember. So answer is northern uh, blot. Okay, next question. Uh, so this question is taken from again from medicinal chemistry. Alprazolam belongs to the class. Pyrolobenzodiazepine, imidazolobenzodiazepine, triazolobenzodiazepine, tetrazolobenzodiazepine. So, a couple of points you need to remember with benzodiazepine. You know that benzodiazepine drugs are sedative hypnotic drugs. They are also used in anxieties. Okay. So, these benzodiazepine drugs, you know the common examples are diazepam, diazepam kind of drugs, oxazepam, the name of the drug ends with zepam, lorazepam, clonazepam, all these drugs end with zepam. Okay. Now, the point you need to remember. When you combine this benzodiazepines with the triazole ring, triazole ring, triazole ring is nothing but a five-membered ring with the three nitrogen atoms. It contains three nitrogen atoms. Now, when you combine this uh, benzodiazepines with the triazole, what the observation is that it will decrease the duration of action of that drug. Okay. For example, a, a drug which has both benzodiazepine and uh, triazole is known as alprazole. Alprazole contains benzodiazepine plus triazole. Also, uh, then um, alprazole, midazole, midazole, the name is zola, Tri then triazole. Okay, so this drug, basically they are, the duration of action is less compared to benzodiazepine. So, alprazole is short acting benzodiazepine and midazole and the triazole are ultra short acting benzodiazepine. Ultra short acting benzodiazepine. So, compared to benzodiazepine, if, you, if, if the benzodiazepine is fused with the trisole ring, the duration of action will come down. Examples are alprazolam, midazolam, triazole. Okay. So, coming back to our question, alprazolam, I told you it is nothing but benzodiazepine combined with the triazole ring. So, the answer for this question is C choice. 
let's move on to the next question of the day in gram staining the secondary stain is a choice crystal violet b methyl violet c gentian violet d saffron so in last video in last discussion i told you gram staining is considered to be a differential stain and it is a very most commonly employed stain why it is differential stain because different colors are used okay. now you need to remember the reagents or the stains in this uh, gram staining so you can remember this mnemonic cv ias cv ias cv of an ias person you can remember like that now cv indicates cv indicates crystal violet so this crystal violet is the primary stain okay remember crystal violet is the primary stain now i stands for iodine iodine is the mordant so what is the function of mordant mordant will help uh, to fix the dye into the slide okay that is a function of mordant and uh, the mordant used is iodine okay a stands for i in ias a stands for alcohol so alcohol the function of alcohol is to decolorize okay the function of alcohol is to decolorize so alcohol is a decolorizer now s stands for saffron now saffron is the secondary state secondary state saffron is the secondary state so we can remember cvis cv is the primary state i iodine is the mordant a alcohol is the decolorizer and s saffron is the secondary state so also remember instead of crystal violet we can use methyl violet or gentian violet as a primary state also you can instead of alcohol you can use acetone also as a decolorizer also apart from saffron you can remember dilute carbo fu carbol fusion and the neutral red they are also can be used as secondary state okay so this is the point you need to remember remember cvias okay for gram staining crystal violet iodine alcohol and saffron these are the commonly employed reagents other examples also you can remember okay let's move on to the question gram staining the secondary stain the answer is simple saffron now let's move on to the next question so this question is taken from the pharmacology which of the following is an incorrect match wrong match a choice irreversible alpha blocker phenoxybenzamine pcc that is a choice b choice reversible alpha blocker phentolamine cheese reaction C choice, a reversible alpha blocker, tolosolin, clonidin, withdrawal. D choice, none of the above. So, which is, a, which is not a correct match, incorrect match in the, with respect to the alpha blocker. So, you know that in, we, we have uh, alpha 1 receptor, we have alpha 2 receptors. Okay. So, certain drugs, when two receptors are there, we can block in three ways. Certain drugs, you can block both alpha 1 plus alpha 2. You can block both alpha 1 and alpha 2. So, they are called as non-selective alpha blocker. Now, you can simply block alpha 1 only. You can block alpha 1 only. So, they are called as selective alpha 1 blocker. Now, you can also simply block alpha 2 receptors only. So, they are called as selective alpha 2 block. So, these are the uh, classification of alpha blockers. Now, this uh, non-selective alpha blocker, you can divide into irreversible, irreversible alpha, uh, non-selective blocker. Also, the second one is the second one is a reversible alpha blocker, non-selective alpha blocker. So, non-selective alpha blocker, again, you can divide into two categories, irreversible and reversible. Now, the drugs coming under the irreversible non-selective blocker is phenoxybenzamine. Phenoxybenzamine. So, when it is irreversible, the drug will be long-acting. When it is reversible, the drug will be short-acting. Okay. Now, coming to the reversible drug, the two drugs you need to remember, phentolamine. Pentolamine and tolazolin. Tolazolin. Okay. So now when it comes to selective alpha blocker, you know the name of the drug end with zosin. Zosin. The example, for example, prazosin, terasosin, doxasosin, alphososin. All the name of the drug will end up with zosin. Also, tamsulosin. Two more drugs you need to remember. Tamsulosin, silodosin. So, these all these drugs are selective alpha 1 blocker. Now, when it comes to alpha 2 blocker, selective alpha 2 block, blocker, the drug you need to remember, yohimbine. This is not clinically important. So, not very important drug. Revolsin. Okay. So, yohimbine and uh, revolsin, they are selective alpha 2 block. Okay. Now, let's come to phenoxybenzamine. Can you tell me what is the use of phenoxy? It's a long-acting alpha blocker, non-selective. So, this is used in pheochromocytoma. So, use of this drug is pheochromocytoma. That means it's a cancer of adrenal gland, okay, where the BP can shoot up. So, the pheochromocytoma, phenoxybenzamine is given. What is the use of phentolamine tolosolin? So, phentolamine tolosolin, it is given in two conditions. One is cheese reaction, cheese reaction. The another use is clonidine withdrawal, the treatment of clonidine withdrawal. 
So there you need a short acting alpha blocker. Okay, so there phentolamine and tolazolin can be used. What about presosin, terazosin, all these drugs can be used in? Yes, benign prostatic hyperplasia along with hypertension. There are stamcylosin, psilodosin. They are specifically used for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, so these are the points you need to remember. Now let's come back to our question, which is an incorrect match. Okay, so irreversible alpha blocker. Yes, phenoxybenzamine is an irreversible blocker. And in which condition it is used? Pheochromocytoma, that is correct. Let's take B choice, reversible alpha blocker. Yes, phentolamine tolosolins are reversible alpha blocker. And I told you it can be used in cheese reaction or clonidine interval. Third choice, reversible tolosolin. It can be used in cheese reaction or clonidine. So that means all these uh, A, B, C are correct. So which is an incorrect match? All are correct. So the correct answer for this question is B choice, none of the above. Let's move on to the next question. Of, okay? Again, it is taken from the pharmacology. Select the non-specific beta blocker. A, nadalol, butoxamine, atenolol, betaxalol. Okay. So here also you need to uh, remember the classification. You know that beta receptors, beta 1 is there, beta 2 is there. Okay. So since two receptors are there, how many ways we can block? We can block beta 1 plus beta 2. Correct. We can block beta 1 plus beta 2. So they are called as non-selective beta blocker. We can simply block beta 1 receptors only, which is mainly present in the heart. So that is called a selective beta 1 blocker or cardio-selective blocker. You can simply block beta 2 receptors. So they are called as selective beta 2 blocker, right? Now here, the examples you need to remember, uh, which are the non-selective beta blocker. So the examples are, you can remember this mnemonic, PPT SONA. So non-selective beta blocker, you remember this mnemonic. The first P stands for propanolol. The name of this drug ends with lol, right? Second P, pintolol. P stands for timolol. SO stands for sotalol and NA stands for nadalol. You can remember this mnemonic PPT SONA. They are non selective beta blocker. Now, when it comes to selective beta 1 blocker or cardio selective beta blocker, again you can remember this mnemonic ABC men. ABC men. What does A stands for? Atenolol. One more uh, drug with A, acibutalol. B stands for betaxalol, also bisoprolol, they are selective beta 1 blocker. C stands for seliprolol, M stands for metoprolol, E stands for the shortest acting beta blocker, beta that is esmalol, they are shortest acting. And N stands for nebivalol, nebivalol. Okay, so you can remember this mnemonic, A, B, C, meth. That is for selective beta 1 blocker or cardio selective beta uh, cardio selective beta blocker. Now, selective beta 2 blocker, you need to remember one example butoxamine. Butoxamine. Okay. So, this is the classification you need to remember with respect to the uh, beta blockers. Let us come back to our question non specific beta blocker. Okay. So, I told you PPT SONA and NA stands for. NA stands for nadalol, which is a non-specific beta blocker. This is butoxamine is beta 2 blocker. Atenolol and uh, uh, this betaxalol, they are beta 1 blocker. Correct? ABC men. Okay, you can remember that. So, the correct answer for this question is uh, nadalol, A choice. Okay. So, hope you understood the 10 questions what we have discussed from the analyst syllabus. Keep on watching. Thank you.